Today we are going to discuss how to prevent infection no matter the environment, asepsis, and how to achieve and use asepsis. Whether it is in your home, school, or a healthcare facility, you can do your part with having the knowledge on how to combat these harmful germs. We will also discuss some vocabulary relating to infections within the healthcare setting, the chain of infection, different methods to break the chain of infection, and the difference between standard precautions and transmission-based precautions. So what does asepsis mean? It means decreased or no pathogens or harmful germs present. There are two types of asepsis, medical asepsis or surgical asepsis. Medical asepsis is when there are decreased harmful germs present or pathogens present. Surgical asepsis is when there are no harmful germs present. These harmful germs and or pathogens are the start of any infection. There are two main types of infection, localized and systemic. Systemic is typically found in the bloodstream and localized is usually contained to a specific part of the body, such as an arm, a leg, foot, or even your face. There are also two different types of methods of acquiring these infections. There are community acquired infections and healthcare acquired infections or HAIs. Just as they sound, community acquired infections are caught out in the community, including your school, your workplace, or your local shopping store. HAIs are infections caught while within a healthcare facility, whether you are in the hospital or a long-term care facility. The chain of infection consists of six links and can be broken at any one of the links. The causative or infectious agent is the virus, bacteria, or other harmful germ that causes a disease or infection. The reservoir or host is the place where the pathogen lives and grows. The portal of exit is any opening on an infected person that allows the harmful germ to leave, such as the nose, mouth, or a cut in the skin. The mode of transmission is how the harmful germs travel from person to person. This can happen from a hug, a handshake, or simply from picking up your children's used tissues. Next comes the portal of entry, which is quite similar to the portal of exit. It is any opening on a not infected person for the harmful germ to enter, such as dry, cracked hands, a cut, the nose, eyes, or mouth. And last but not least is the susceptible host, which is any not infected person that could become infected from the harmful germ. So the question becomes, how do we break the chain? There are so many different ways, including the ones I've listed on the slide, but I'm sure if you think about this at home or at your office, you could list several other methods. The number one method of breaking the chain of infection is hand hygiene. It sounds simple, right? It is that simple. Properly washing your hands or using alcohol-based hand rubs can protect yourself and your patients or residents from catching that harmful germ or pathogen that could be harbored in your hands from the last person you were working with or the last person you shook hands with. Wearing gloves, cleaning surfaces, bagging soiled items prior to entering common areas, and proper disposal of contaminated or dirty garbage are all great ways to break the different links in the chain of infection but it will never be good old-fashioned hand hygiene. So leading into hand washing and sanitizing, I want you all to take a moment and think about how often you wash or sanitize your hands in a day. Think about all of the surfaces you touch, the people you come in direct contact with, how often you touch your own face or hair. Compare the two. Do you think you wash or sanitize your hands often enough? Before I entered the healthcare field, I truly never thought about it. The results were surprising. So now we're going to watch the proper procedure and technique for hand washing per the World Health Organization guidelines. From start to finish, your hand washing should take 40 to 60 seconds. To time yourself, you could simply sing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star or Happy Birthday twice.
Using alcohol-based hand rubs can be a very effective and useful method for asepsis, as long as your hands are not visibly soiled and you ensure to rub until your hands are dry. This process should take 20 to 30 seconds total, which would be singing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star or Happy Birthday through one time. Ensure you pause this education after watching the demonstration videos to practice the techniques. Please note that this technique is not appropriate when hands are visibly dirty or after using the toilet. In these cases, hand washing is required. Hand rubbing should take you 20 to 30 seconds. Use a timer or count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 in each of the following steps. Apply a palm full of alcohol-based hand rub in a cupped hand, enough to cover all surfaces of the hands. Rub hands palm to palm, then rub right palm over the back of left hand with interlaced fingers and vice versa. Rub again palm to palm with fingers interlaced. Rub the back of your fingers to opposing palms with fingers interlocked, repeating this action for each hand. Rub rotationally left thumb clasped in right palm and vice versa. To clean the tips of your fingers, rub rotationally backwards and forwards with clasped fingers of right hand in left palm and vice versa. Once dry, your hands are now clean and safe. Now we have two sets of precautions. The first set is standard precautions, which are an important part of asepsis. The common understanding of standard precautions is the consideration that any blood or secretions coming from a resident or patient are considered to be infected and then treated as such. Standard precautions includes hand hygiene, wearing gloves, wearing other pieces of personal protective equipment as needed, for example, goggles and face mask if someone is coughing in your face, properly disposing of waste, handling soiled linen correctly, and cleaning of equipment in between patients or residents. Transmission-based precautions are specific to the individual's infectious status. There are three different types of transmission-based precautions, including contact precautions, droplet precautions, and airborne precautions. Your personal protective equipment will depend on the type of precautions the person is on. All three precautions require isolation of the patient or resident. Contact precautions are put in place when there is a concern of the patient transferring the infection from touch or contact. Contact precautions would be useful for infections such as lice, scabies, pink eye, and MRSA. PPE or personal protective equipment would include a gown and gloves. Droplet precautions are put in place when there is a concern of the patient transferring the infection by droplets and excessive coughing, sneezing, and other bodily fluids. These droplets are not small enough to be transferred to the air. Droplet precautions would be useful for infections such as pneumonia and influenza. PPE would include gown, gloves, and a face mask. Airborne precautions are put in place when the droplets are so small they can be transmitted through the air. Airborne precautions would be useful for an infection such as tuberculosis. PPE would require gown, gloves, and face mask, which might be a specialized face mask for the type of infection such as an N95 mask or a HEPA filter system. So we've gone over a lot of material in a short amount of time. In the next session, we will delve a little deeper into the proper donning and removing of personal protective equipment while we practice in our lab how to enter, provide care for, and exit a patient's room who is on different types of isolation precautions. Just as a quick self-quiz, I'd like you to take a minute and match the vocabulary with their definitions to make sure you understood the basics. If you got them all correct, Good job. If not, it's okay. Go back and review and try again. 
If you'd like more information, please leave your email address in the comments section and I can forward links, handouts, and videos to assist in your understanding. Thank you, and I look forward to seeing you in lab next week.